conceptual perspective. Talk about Dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse. Uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you. Everybody is Dr. Rick dropping in on you. Hope everybody is doing okay. This won't be long, uh, but it's definitely important. It's in the vein of my passion. Uh, obviously, you know the routine. You saw the preview. Uh, we need support. Uh, we need you to show your love for the work that we do in the community. And we are doing a lot, and I'm going to share some of that. I'm actually on my way to a meeting uh, that deals with some of the things that we're doing in the community from housing uh, domestic abuse uh, victims to uh, helping the mentally ill and uh, addicted um, and so much more uh, on a cross the board spectrum from housing to resources and everything physically being there and we're going to branch out from Houston into Dallas into San Antonio Austin and then on out uh, this is starting right out the box in 2020 and it's a monumental effort uh, and on top of everything we already do so again uh, I'm excited about it uh, but it's a lot of work with that being said if you believe in what we do and what we've been doing for years uh, show, some, show some love show some support donate uh, my, our goal this week by the end of this weekend is $10,000 uh, I think that's more than uh, reasonable for all the work that we do. And that's the goal. And I'm going to be pushing that from the remainder of the week. So you're going to be hearing a lot about it. Um, but we're also going to be talking about things that are important. We're going to be talking about uh, relevant events. Uh, the one I want to talk to you about now is uh, the shocking news of the untimely death of Stephen Boss, or Stephen Twitch Boss who first hit the scene, man, way back in 2008 um, as a runner-up on uh, So You Think You Can Dance. And it's funny because one of my clients, one of my first clients, uh, when I was going through my recovery, uh, business recovery, rebuilding my business, one of my first clients was a second place runner-up season two, um, Melissa and Johnny. Uh, was one of my first clients and now she's traveling the world doing all kind of mad crazy stuff so it's it's weird you know the connection but uh, that's where he got his start and he eventually became most uh, known for being the DJ on the Ellen DeGeneres show and then becoming an executive producer for the Ellen, Ellen, Ellen DeGeneres uh, show all the way when it, it finally ended uh, not that long ago and uh, he was 40 years old and he took his own life um, there is something to be said I have been talking about mental health in black men for a very long time mental health and depression is an issue that reaches everybody nobody is excluded for it, from it. Nobody is exempted from it. 
Um, but my concern, and I started sounding this trumpet probably about eight years ago, is the increasing level or the spiking in black suicides. Uh, you know, there used to be this uh, cultural idea, even though it wasn't accurate, this cultural idea that black people don't kill themselves. Black people have killed themselves. Um, I experienced the immediate aftermath of a suicide before I was 10 years old, lady across the street, bar friend, uh, uh, went and sat in his car in her driveway and killed himself, literally a stone's throw off away from my house. And so that's the first experience and exposure to it. So it happens and it, it didn't just start, but the spike in the way that it's happening is something to be observed and aware of. And I've been sounding the clarion. There are two populations that are of concern, even though Stephen doesn't fit into either of these populations, he is in a population uh, of concern. But the two populations that most concern me are our little girls. Uh, and there are two intersection, uh, intersecting uh, populations, the um, five to el five to 11 and 10 to 13. And, and the reason they intersect is they are coming from two different studies about it and those are the groups they studied. So what it basically tells me is that uh, ages five to 13, there's a spike. There's a spike in uh, suicides amongst our little girls, five to 13. It's not just that it's a spike, it's that they are now leading that category, ages five to 13, with suicides. So nobody in between, no fem no girls between the age of five and 13 are killing themselves at a higher rate than black girls. That's the first thing. The second thing is young black males ages 14 to 24 have seen a, a spike in the rate of suicide of 49%. It has increased by almost 50% over the last six years. So that's an area of concern. First and foremost, we have to gain a better understanding of, we have to gain a better understanding of depression. We need to gain a better understanding of mental illness. Uh, we need to understand that you don't just will depression away, uh, that uh, people aren't always doing things for attention. Um, that just because someone can put on a strong facade and smile doesn't mean they're okay. Uh, we need to be more aware of the signs of depression uh, outside of the facade or behind the facade. Uh, we need to have more programs that are working on the front end of this where we are dealing with the strengthening of the self-image, strengthening of the black psyche so that it isn't as easy to beat a person down to the point of uh, persistent depression. Uh, everybody goes through bouts of depression, sadness that just comes upon you and it's there for a day, two, maybe even a week. That is normal. You're just going to have times where you don't have it and everything seems to be going a certain way and and you, the way you're processing it isn't allowing you to get out of it. But eventually there's something that comes along that gets you out of it. You snap out of it. You come back. Life comes. Persistent depression is this constant state that you're battling so much that it becomes painful. It becomes overwhelming. And it becomes hard to even wake up to. And normally there are suicidal you know suicidal ideations that precede suicide attempts you know significantly uh in a time of significant length before it actually happens and sometimes it's just this i finally reached this moment and i can't do it but normally there are signs they are talking to you they're telling you watch what they're doing uh do they have long-term plans laid out that they consistently talk about? Do they get excited about something in the distant future? Um, you know, you know, look for look for signs that says, "Hey, 
no, they don't sound like they're planning on be, doing anything beyond X, Y, Z. And it, it, it'll not only give you an idea that there may be a problem, it'll tell you about how much time you have to really reach out and help them. Uh, because a lot of times what happens with these suicidal ideations that lead to suicide or suicide attempts is they made up in their mind if something doesn't change by by next year, by this date, by my next birthday, by whatever, then it's a, I'm, I'm, I'm tired, I'm done. And so that's their by date. And they're giving it a chance. And what you also have to understand, because it's easy for people to sit up and talk about um, how selfish a person is to kill themselves. And what you're not looking at is the dynamic of what it takes to even get to a point of suicide. Suicide is saying, I am making the most finite decision I can make. I am making the most finite move. There's no coming back. There's no changing my mind. There is no way around it. I am literally choosing to end it forever. And for you to be at that point, what you have to do is have a point of helplessness and hopelessness that's so consuming that you don't think it ever will get better. See, when you think, when there's hope, there's, well, some at some point it's going to get better. I've seen people last, outlast five years of just total devastation. It's one thing after another. And they just, I, and it's because of hope. It's because in their mind, at some point, all of this is going to make sense and I'm going to come out of it. And that hope, hope is powerful. You got to learn how to breed hope in the lives of people. And you got to understand that we're not living in a world that reads your every move in real time. They see what you're doing. They see how you live. They see what you're doing. And you literally have a bunch of people who are miserable that are actually celebrating uh, the struggles, the difficulties, the failures in your life. And they are literally putting that energy out. There's so many things that people have to battle now that they didn't have to battle 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, even in the black community. And now we're sitting up and we're seeing the the, the ultimate result of it. Uh, my, again, my, my prayers go out to his family and friends, um, his loved ones. Uh, my prayer also goes out to the family and friends and loved ones of every person who has lost their battle with depression. Um, and my hope is that we continue to do something. That's one of the things. That's one of the reasons why I'm so I'm so proud of the work we do in the in the area of mental health at the Odyssey Project and at the Visionetics Institute. Institute. It's one of the things that I am immensely pa passionate about because it is going to not only impact how you perform, it's going to impact the life and health and the future of so many other people. You know, now he has young children that are going to have to find their way through this. And again, the easy notion and the easy idea is to sit up and talk about how selfish it was to leave his children. That's coming from a reasonable train of thought. That's coming from someone who wasn't sitting where he was sitting when he did that. I guarantee you a reasonable person isn't thinking about ending their life. A reasonable person isn't thinking about walking away from what they love the most you have to really have truly reached a point where you don't have hope of ever being better and the pain that you're experiencing within this battle of depression is so great and so consuming that it's overtaking you and you have reached a point where you say the only way to escape it is to leave this place and that's not about reason that's not about rationale that's not about making good sense that's about a place of hopelessness and helplessness that the average person can't even fathom and in helping people that are at this place it's an intense engagement because you are trying to get them to look around the most emphatic and inexorable force in their life and say there's something else outside of that and it's not easy uh what i suggest anybody out there struggling with depression and i'm not talking about momentary uh minor depression but that too if you if it's if it's depressing and you feel like hey man enough is enough you need to seek professional help and in the black community what we've got to do is we've got to get to a point to where we are actually encouraging 
our people to get professional help, that we remove the stigma of mental illness and mental health counseling and con and therapy and, and, and whatever we need to do to make ourselves better. We've got to remove that stigma, and especially when it comes to black men. That's not a space. What Black women, uh, statistics show that black women suffer from depression more than any other group, but it also shows that they're more likely to report it. Now, while there's a lag in the, uh, in, uh, the distinction between reporting it and seeking actual therapy, at least they're letting people know. Black men are the least likely to admit that they are feeling sad, that they are depressed because black men see that as a weakness. And at the end of the day, appearing strong and ultimately ending up leaving family and loved ones who need and depend on you behind is not an option. It's much better to sit up and say, I'm overwhelmed. I don't know how much more I can take. And we don't have that opportunity. We don't have that permission in black culture for black men to say, I'm not at my strongest. The idea is to, even when I'm not strong, say I'm strong, appear strong, put on the flex. Why? Because I don't know what might happen if somebody knows I'm weak. I'm, I, I can't afford to be vulnerable. And when I can't afford to be vulnerable, I pretend. And pretension is not an escape from reality. And so um, I'm encouraging everybody, check on your loved ones, especially, now here's the thing, especially the ones that you think have it all together. Check on the ones who are normally the ones that everybody runs to. Check on the ones that always seem to hold it down. Check on, because nobody is unbreakable. Nobody is impervious to the pushes of psychological pressure. Some of us manage it well. Some of us have become extremely experienced and strengthened in the fact that we've had to do it for so long that we've become very good at it. And for the most part, we're okay, but you never know at what point we're going through some things. And while I've never had suicidal ideations, I can tell you I've been sad, I've been down, and I've had to fight through it. And so I can't imagine what it feels like to be at a level where you wanna quit because I've never wanted to quit. I've never given up. I've never looked at it and said, man, this is it for me. I've always been able to see my impact in this world, my place in this world. I've always known who I am and why I'm needed in, in so many different ways, in so many different places. And that sense of purpose holds me and steadies me. And it gives me a reason to wake up every morning and put on my A game and go out into this world. But even with that, I can tell you there are moments where it's like, you gotta like really say, get your butt up and get to it. Now, what you gotta understand, don't confuse what I'm talking about with thinking you can out tough depression. Why I'm able to do what I'm doing is because I keep a bearing on my mental health, my emotional health, my spiritual health, and my physical health. The decline in any of those areas impacts the other. And that's something that we really and truly need to understand. So when, I, when I'm talking about this, I'm really hoping that I'm getting my point across. Um, you, you, you never think that this happens. And the reason that it's important for me to talk about this, the reason that it's important for me to uh, really speak in depth on it, is because he's simply a microcosm of a much bigger issue that is a threat. Uh, he's not an anomaly. So you can't just say, man, wow, that's a one-off. No, that's a problem. We've had a lot of high-profile black male suicides and black females. We've had several beauty contestants. Miss USA killed herself last year. Jumped from an apartment building which is weird because jumpers are normally men. And so, um, you know, 
you never know what driving force is behind it uh, under the surface if you haven't dealt with it. I'm not here to diagnose or, you know, speculate. What I can tell you is at some, whatever was going on with him was enough for him to sit up and say, I can't do it anymore. Uh, that's a lot. And at the end of the day, there are, I think he has at least two kids, maybe three. Uh, but I know that he has at least two um, that are going to have to find a way to cope with this. This is um, going to be an ongoing thing. And this is how we have to as a people, both as society as a whole and as an enclave, a racial enclave, understand the depths of depression and that our blackness doesn't provide or offer an exemption from depression. And we need to stop selling that narrative that you know blacks don't kill themselves, that blacks don't have time to be depressed and you know, you know, uh strong black women, you know, We've strong black women, our women to death, literally. Stop it. The, my whole thing is in the same vein where I make the point that we need to stop lecturing black men about fighting harder for their children and start asking why they have to. We need to stop praising black women for being so strong and ask why they have to be. Why isn't there a unified togetherness? Why aren't we working together? Why aren't we building together? Why aren't we caring for one another? Why is someone having to carry a disproportionate uh, burden when we could all share in this? We could all love one another. That could be a family togetherness and communion. That could be a, a community togetherness and communion uh, and a racial togetherness and communion. And all of this stuff is possible, but not when we're sitting up and we are praising dysfunctional identities and seeing value in killing ourselves to prove a point. And I'm not saying don't do it, because sometimes when you're left in a position and that's all you have is you, you gotta do what you gotta do, but that can't be the narrative, that can't be the normal story. We've gotta do better, we've gotta understand that men are human, black men are human, they're not animals, they can have emotional breaks and we've got a lot of that. If they're not hurting themselves, they're hurting somebody else. And so uh, my thing is I'm going to challenge us to do better uh, in checking on one another and taking care of ourselves and being willing to admit I'm not at my best. That's the challenge. And so I'm on that note, I'm gonna get ready to get out of here. As I said at the beginning, uh, this is just a part of the work that we're already doing. And I can tell you just by the work we do, we're overwhelmed. This is an issue. I've been, t and the thing is, the one thing you're going to find out about me, if you haven't figured it out, you're going to be able to go back seven, eight years and you're going to see videos. You're going to see uh, articles. You're going to read in my books that were published during that time, things that you're seeing happen right now, because it's predictable. When you study, you see the patterns, uh, of things and you understand how things move and you, 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 you've, you've developed an understanding of an area of expertise that allows you to determine, hey, if we don't do something about it, this is gonna happen. And so you say, hey, this is what we can look forward to. And I've been screaming from the rooftop that we are going to have a cataclysmic collapse in, in the mental health arena. And it's happening now. So we need to do something about it. Um, on that note, if you believe in the work we're doing, show some love. Uh, go to the description box. You can either give by clicking the link or give through the organization's cash app handle. But whatever, that needs to be more awareness and that needs to be more commitment. On that note, I'm out of here. You guys have an unbelievable day.